afternoon, almost good night, everyone. Housekeeping, your first homework assignment will be released on Monday. So we will start off. Yay, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Programming homework assignments. You're going to write code, fun code, security code. Um, if you don't like coding, you should probably drop this class. <laughs> We're going to find out that soon enough. Cool. Any questions before we get started? Don't ask me what the assignment's going to be. Sorry, I had that off. Anything else? Yes. What did you say you're posting it? On Monday. We'll talk about it in class. We'll be ready during class. What if yes. computers have bad What if what? Ask someone to borrow a charger. Yes. Is it two textbooks for the course? Um, can you comment on the material and the context you should be looking at? Yes. So on the textbook, let's see. I'll bring up the. So we left off on Monday on ARP spoofing. So we saw how a host C, this is where we left off, right? I think so. Yes, okay, we did this. Yes, so we saw that uh, an attacker that's on the local network, right, an attacker that is on the same switch or local area network as two hosts can trick each host and change their, basically their ARP table entries to say, if you want to talk from host A to host B, talk to essentially host C's MAC address. And if host B wants to talk to host A, then they should talk to host C's MAC address. So all communication will first go through host C on the local area network, and neither host will actually know that this is happening. So. There's some problems though while you do this, right? Because the cache, the ARP cache can be invalidated. Um, somebody may ask who, you know, you may have an ARP request. And so it could be the case that host B tells host A it's real address, it's real MAC address. And then all of a sudden you've lost this connection. Uh, so you're the bad guy, what do you do? Or bad person, doesn't have to be man or woman. Yeah. <coughs> So once you 
By using these ARC techniques to route all traffic from one host to the other, you can then use these tools to force the traffic to go through you and to actually see all the communication that's happening. Cool. Uh, EnterCap is also another tool for performing these man-in-the-middle attacks. You can do ARC spoofing. You can intercept SSH. Uh, you can collect passwords. It's a really cool, fun one to play with. Um, I'm not really going to go into this. You set up which groups you want to be poisoned to which other groups. You then on your system, so the key is your system needs to do packet forwarding. Right? So when you get a request from host A to host B, you need to forward that request on. And so you need to set up in your, because by default, most systems don't do this, don't act as routers. Right, so on Linux, you have to <laughs> enable IP forwarding inside the settings. So this is how you do that there. Uh, then you start the poisoning with the editor cap tool. And then you actually collect all the traffic so you can use our handy dandy TCP dump that we talked about on Monday. And you get to dump all the traffic that's getting sent in between those two hosts. So this kind of shows how easy this is to perform. So, you just learned about the attack. Should do. How do you defend against this? You're, you are protecting the network. What do you do to defend against this? Yes? Static, static ARC tables. Static ARC tables. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, you can statically program the ARC tables on each of the machines. Anybody program like static IP and static routes before? Yeah. Is that a pain to do in a large network? Would it then, then now if you had to not only do static IPs, static routes, but all of the MAC addresses for all of the physical machines on your local area network, you'd have to put on each machine. Setup is kind of rough. And what happens if you get a new NIC? Right? Now you have to update everyone else's ARC table entry that you statically program so that you can, uh, they can actually talk to your new machine. What else? So you can look for replies that have the wrong response, right? That could be a way to look for it. So try to detect it in the traffic. What else? Yeah. Uh, if I if I come up with a mechanism such that any two server can talk only if they have a valid certificate, or like so if if I uh, pass the IP or MAC through encrypted ones so that they can only decrypt only using their keys or like RSA. So how do you how do you transmit those keys? Uh, so uh, if if I'm going to uh, enable the system on my IP uh, on my network, uh, I would basically give them a key so that they can uh, and some list of steps so that they can uh, actually encrypt their key, which can only be decrypted by some other person who's having the public key. So if I have that scenario, person C, uh, I mean the hacker will never have any key, so he will never be able to map uh, the forwarding. So it won't make any sense for him to like to where they forward the packet. I agree that it kind of has the same drawback though, the static ARP tables, right? Is you have to do a lot of manual configuration on each machine to make sure the keys are all distributed properly yeah. and uh, all those kinds of issues. But uh, yeah, if you could do that, you know, yeah, it would be, you'd it would definitely be another layer. Um, you know, so we can, like we said, we can do static ARP entries. It could be difficult to manage in a large installation. Um, one idea that can be nice, right, to think about, you know, it's not a, always a good idea to throw away an entire defense just because there are some bypasses, right, or because it's difficult, right? So there's some user experience or maybe setup problems. If it does offer a lot of really good security for critical servers, maybe that makes sense to do. Right, so like a DNS server you don't want, um, you wouldn't want, so maybe you could do that, or maybe you can hard code gateways, <coughs> that would be another thing. You can also, I think we mentioned this on Monday, so you can have the operating system ignore unsolicited ARP replies, right? So they, the kernel now would have to keep track of what replies have I sent and what have I gotten responses for, <coughs> and if I get a response for something I've never sent, then throw it away. Um, unfortunately, we also talk about this is still vulnerable, right? Because you just have to wait, and you wait until that person sends an ARP request that says, hey, who's at this 
uh, where is this IP at what MAC address? And all you have to do is beat the other one's reply, and now your reply is legitimate and the other one is not legitimate. I'm sure you can. I'm sure in Linux you can. I'm using, I mean, you may have to read by your kernel or something. For not every time they are listening to and only for specific time they are listening and updating their cache. Yes. It's, the problem is if you have stale entries, that means if machines move to different network cards or something like that, right? Now you can't talk to that machine until you try to refresh, right? So, um, but yeah, you could, you know, it's, it's adding more difficulty to the to the attack, but it doesn't really fundamentally solve kind of the attack, right? Because I can just, I don't care if I have to wait a day. If I can do it once, then now I've gotten intercepted all of your traffic, right? Yeah. What if you implement a target that can be used to get the opportunity to come back? Like a timing in what sense? So. from one host to the other, the TTL should be one, or decreased <coughs> by one. 
here, if it's decreased by two because it's going through your system, maybe that would tell them. Of course, then the attacker should change their operating system to not decrease the TTL value, and then now that's not very good. But maybe there's delays, there's extra delays uh, because they're going through another system. Or some other ideas. Yes? Monitor the routes. Louder. Monitor the routes. Monitor the routes. Yes, you could monitor, although the routes, so when we talk about routing, kind of brings up IP hops, right? And here we're just talking about one hop networks, essentially, like local networks. Um, so yeah, monitoring the, the routing in there, uh, that could definitely lead to detecting snippers. What about a completely passive sniffer? Let's say you're on a hub. Don't use a hub. <laughs> yes, but what if you're using a switch and they've, I don't know, they've done some art poisoning to make it seem like all of your MAC addresses are on the airport too, so they get your traffic too. It's a really difficult problem, right? Uh, don't be surprised you have to solve that in like two seconds. So they're typically passive, right? This is what makes it so difficult to detect. Um, and okay, so yes, we talked about if we can run code on your machine, yes, we can see if you're sniffing or not. Uh, we can use ifconfig on a Linux machine to see the configuration, and we can see that one of the interfaces has been put in promiscuous mode. Uh, and you can see that here in this example. Uh, but if you have something executing the kernel, Right? You can control the operating system. You can have the operating system lie and say that it's not in promiscuous mode when you run IF config, but it actually is in promiscuous mode and is listening. Right? So um, we can look for suspicious ARP activity. So this is what we talked about. Right? So you can look at the traffic that's being sent. If there's any suspicious ARP thing, uh, if you're doing ARP cache poisoning attacks, these are noisy and are sending lots of ARP packets. Um, there are tools to detect that, so not even just using general IDS tools, there are specific tools to look for these. You can look for, ooh, this is a good one. So uh, if they're using a sniffer that is looking, so as we talked about, uh, TCP dump can be used in the mode that automatically looks up IP addresses to try to reverse <coughs> resolve DNS names. So you could like send out packets uh, with weird IP addresses or weird domain names to see who queries that, and nobody should do it, but if one person does it, maybe you found them out that way. Um, yeah, so you would basically try to fake a 
an IP packet from a host that's not on your network and see who tries to resolve that domain name. Right? That's how, so this is kind of the try to get them to do something, like throw something at them and see if they respond right, in a way that they shouldn't. Uh, the really interesting technique is latency. Right? So you think about it, what their machine is doing is listening to every packet that's coming in and doing some processing on it, maybe logging it or whatever, but fundamentally it's doing more work than other machines. So you could maybe detect it by kind of um, every packet will be processed, so you can ping the time of host A, and you can see that the response time is higher than other similar machines, and maybe you could detect it that way. Um, or you can generate a huge amount of traffic to other machines. Right? So instead, generate a lot of traffic from U and A, and then ping B, host B, to see if his uh, response time changes based on the traffic you send to A. Right? It shouldn't, but if it does, maybe that means that's a signal that they're sniffing your network. Um, so other types of weird behavior, right? So you can try to use weirdness when it's in promiscuous mode. So some kernels accept a packet that has the wrong ethernet address with the right destination IP, so you could try sending them an IP packet just to them, but with the wrong destination MAC address, and see if they respond to you, that means they're in promiscuous mode. So you can use kind of, so the idea is the um, IP, the TCP IP whole networking stack, right, changes subtly its behavior if it's in promiscuous mode or not. And so from the outside, if you know those changes, you can make these kind of detections from the outside. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so the idea was send an ICMP a ping request to them with the wrong ethernet address, but the correct IP address, and if you get a response back, that means that they're sniffing. Um, there's a tool that covers some of these that you can look at, it's pretty old. Um, so fundamentally, it's difficult, right? It's actually a very hard problem. But it's actually, it's, it's interesting to think about how to, how do you detect something that's just listening, right, and doesn't ever say anything. Um, another way is you can just completely control the network access, right? So another way would be don't allow any random person to just plug in to your switch, right? <coughs> As we said, that can mitigate some attacks, right? This can mitigate attacks where random people, attackers come in and plug in. It doesn't mitigate the attacks when uh, a person's machine gets compromised who's actually plugged into our switch. Um, so you know, these attacks require physical access, so hey, stop them, right? So it seems kind of silly, because how can you stop people from plugging things into switches, right? I mean, it's just like the switch in the wall. Um, and so there's a protocol, 802.1x, that does port-based access control. So basically, your laptop connects to a switch and does authentication between your computer and the switch to say, no, this is who I am, I'm supposed to be on this network, and only if you pass the authentication check will it allow you to access the network. Um, I would say, I don't know if that's true. It sounds similar to high level to basically the security we use on the ASU network, right? You have to give your ASU uh, username and password in order to access the wireless. So it'd be a similar type of thing, but with wired access. Okay. Um, and so this is a nice way to actually enforce this security, to have it be that you cannot plug in if you don't have a username and password. Okay, so we talked about ARP spoofing. Now we want to see how can we fake IP packets. So what does spoofing mean at a high level? We talked about ARP spoofing a little bit. What does spoofing mean? Tend to be somebody you're not. Yeah, tend to be somebody you're not. Like, I could be spoofing being a professor right now. What? <laughs> yeah, none of you looked at my credentials ever. Right? You don't know. I could not even be, I could have just made a website with some guy's name, and now I've just gotten to teach classes. Basically, the entire movie would catch me if you can. I highly recommend that movie. Uh, so, the idea is we want to send a packet as if with the source <coughs> IP of somebody else. So we want to make it seem like a packet came from somebody else. So we're on a subnet of 11.10.20. We have our nice network. We have 11.10.24, and we have a 
This looks like an old school PDA, but uh, whatever, pot on mobile phone. Uh, 11, 10, 20, 76, and we're at 11, 10, 20, 121, right? And so the idea is we want to send a packet as if it was coming from 111, 110, sorry, 111, 10, 20, 76 to 111, 10, 20, 14, right? So we want to do this, what happens? What's the first thing that happens when we want to send out this packet? What do we need to know? MAC address. We need to know the MAC address of 111 uh, to the destination, 111, 10, 20, 14. Right? And so this will actually work even if we put a different from MAC address. It actually doesn't do any checking there. So we get do an ARC request, we say who has this IP address, we cache that, and then we can just create a packet to 111, 10, 20, 76 from 111, 10, 20, 14. And so when this machine gets it, it looks at what IP address sent this packet, who's it gonna think it came from? Yeah, the mobile phone. Right, so it would be just like this packet went to the mobile phone. Now, what happens when now this computer wants to respond to that packet? What are they going to do? They're going to respond to the packet. So they take the, uh, in this case, the, I think my source and destination message. The source ID, there we go. It's going to take the source ID 111 10 20 76. If it doesn't have it in its ARP cache, it's going to make an ARP request. It's going to get a reply. And so where will the return packet go? To the mobile phone. So this is a key part, right? So when we look at the IP packet, the IP headers, right? There's nothing in there that says I'm actually at this IP address or I have this IP address, right? The same thing with the lower level on the link layer. There's nothing that says I have this MAC address or I'm at this MAC address. Right? Nobody's actually doing that checking. Right? So the important thing here is I send a packet. I can spoof. I, can I spoof the to address? What's the point of that? <laughs> exactly. What's the point? It doesn't make any sense. It's a nonsensical question, right? Whatever you put in that to address, that's the address it's going to go to, right? So. Yes, I agree. It's testing. Right? Doesn't make sense to spoof the to address. Why? Because a packet that you send will always go to that IP address if it can. Right? You can't try to. Well. Yeah, I guess you could. You could. Okay, you could put a different. Let's see. If you put a different to address with a and force it to have the same MAC address, the packet will go to this computer, but it won't be processed. The the kernel will just drop it because it'll check and see, oh, this is for somebody else. It's not for my IP address, right? So, yeah, fundamentally, wherever you put in that to address, that's where your packet's going. Right? So you can't spoof a to address. It doesn't make sense. You can spoof a from address, but what don't you get? The reply. You do not get the reply. And this is a key concept to grasp, and this is why we study the core networking protocol. So we can understand when we look at higher level layers and we talk about TCP spoofing, like Kevin Mitnick used, or ARP uh, UDP spoofing, right? We can see that from these fundamental characteristics at the IP layer, that causes different behaviors at the top layer. But we can do this. Nothing in the network stops us from creating this packet, right? The switch just looks at the from and to MAC addresses and puts it out on the right port, sends it to that machine. This machine looks at it. There's nothing in there that says, hey, this is actually from you know, 10, 111, 10, 20, 76. So it just sees this packet and it responds. Cool. So IP spoofing is critical because it forms the basis of other attacks. And we'll definitely look at those. So you can spoof DNS requests or NFS requests. Um, Sometimes people use, uh, specifically, will use the IP address to do authentication. So as we saw, if 
there's a trust relationship between that phone and that computer, if I can spoof that packet and make it think like it's coming from the phone, then that will be trusted communication. Uh, lots of tools available to do this, to play with uh, IP spoofing. Um, and there's generic tools and protocol specific tools, and we'll kind of get into those protocol specific tools. Uh, but that's kind of where we'll leave IP spoofing for now because we haven't talked about what to use it for, right? But the key concepts there are critical. Um, so now I'm going to talk about different. So what we've looked at so far is tools. So kind of my <coughs> high level philosophy, uh, what I. I want to teach you guys the skills to create the tools. I don't want you to be a person who relies on tools. Right? I think that's important uh, to carry, especially in security. Like, yes, if you're doing a professional gig or whatever, you need you know, use every tool that you have available. Right? You need to have the level of knowledge where you could build one of these tools. Because they're not magic. They just do all the techniques that we've talked about. And so by being able to really understand things at that level, you should be able to code these things. So now I'm going to talk about some libraries that you can use to code uh, network sniffers and do all kinds of cool packet manipulation things. Uh, so LibNet is a platform independent library that allows you to build, create, inject arbitrary packets. So you can completely control MAC addresses, IP addresses, everything in the TCP header. You can completely control everything in you can write Ethernet spoof frames. You can spoof frames from other people. You can do custom ARP attacks by hand. Uh, you, it's, it's a C library, I guess I should have led off with. And it has, oh, I'll be optimistic and say maybe the situation has changed uh, now, but it used to have some of the worst documentation of any project that I've ever seen. Uh, but it actually worked, which was super cool. And a lot of these tools build on top of these libraries when they build uh, sniffers. So why do you want to use C for something like injecting packets or doing network manipulation? Yeah. It's close to the kernel. It's low level. It's low level. What did that get you? Speed. 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 Yes. You get a lot of packets, right? And so the kernel, if you don't respond in time, will sometimes drop packets, right? And so now. You want to be as fast as possible while processing packets, exactly. So that's why a lot of these networking tools are written in C. Um, so you have to initialize the memory, you have to initialize the network, you have to construct the packet that you want to make. Uh, you need to calculate the packet checksums so they're appropriate for the values that you have. Um, and then you actually inject the packet onto the wire. So it's really cool because you, you literally control everything about the packet. Like if you want to experiment and figure out uh, what do different routers or switches do when I change the uh, terms, the, not the terms of service, the uh, service flags and IP headers, what happens? These are the kind of tools you use to do that. Okay, the other cool, the, the other tool that is really cool is Scappy, or Scappy, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, it is a Python based library. It is awesome. Uh, you can very quickly, it has a really cool um, uh, interactive prompt mode where you can kind of craft packets and look at things interactively, <coughs> like IPython, if you're familiar with that. Uh, you can also write whole you know, scripts that run and use this. Uh, it has libraries and support for both sniffing and spoofing. So you can read in packets, arbitrarily change packets. <coughs> this is like one of the coolest things like after doing a project in Lib, uh, LibNet and then doing one in Scappy, it's like night and day. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, it's slower than using LibPCAP and LibNet, but it's a lot easier to use. So for example, to spend, send like a spoofed IMC, ICMP packet, this is all you need to do. You send an IP packet with a source of this, a destination of this, and you wrap that in an ICMP message and you're done. And it does everything. It sends it out. Uh, very cool. Okay, so sniffing and spoofing, right? So if we pretend to be from someone else and we can sniff, we can actually try to hijack connections, right? And this is, we've kind of alluded to this in, a, in 
a little while, and so now we're going to actually look at how you perform hijacking attacks. So the idea is you sniff the network, waiting for some kind of request, depending on what you're trying to hijack, and then you race the host to send a legitimate reply. So for instance, like we had with ARP hijacking, right? Your sniff, you can sniff well. If you can just poison them, it's really easy. You just poison them. If you can't, you would sniff the network, wait for ARP requests, and quickly send a reply back before the other machine had a chance to respond. So there's ARP style, which I just described, the UDP style, and TCP style variations of this attack. So we'll see these later, but I just wanted to define what hijacking, when I say hijacking, you're trying to hijack a connection, or hijack a request, this is what we're talking about. So now we get into routing. So we've only looked at, even though we've looked at IP for a long time, and it's actually kind of really interesting, right? Even just focusing on such a small layer, like the link layer, right? We already found vulnerabilities, and we're able to attack the network layer just looking at the link layer, like ARP traffic, right? And then looking out one level up and saying, okay, now what if we include IP but restrict everybody to be on the same network, right? We saw that there's still attacks that you can do and sniffing that you can do and <coughs> ARP poisoning and hijacking that you can do there, right? So now we say, okay, what happens if we go up one more? So we know that the goal of IP is to get a packet from one IP address to another when they can be in different networks. And what we looked at so far is just what happens if they're in the same network. So now we're going to look at how does we call so the opposite of like direct delivery when you're on the same physical local area network when they have to go to opposite networks or not opposite there's no such thing as opposite network uh, when they have to go to somebody else's network how does how do those routing steps actually occur? So we're going to look at how that happens and then look at what attacks this enables and this is, gets us to like very cool stuff. So, how does the host know if it's trying to send a packet to something that and it needs to use indirect routing? Does the address have a different subnet? Yes, it checks the IP address it's trying to talk to and it looks at its local subnet and says, is this in my local subnet? If it is not, where does it go? Yeah, so it needs another piece of information. So this isn't something we didn't really touch on it. So when you set up the networking, you need, you need to know your IP address. You need to know what sub-network you're on. And you need to know who's my gateway. Who do I talk to if I don't need to get packets to this network? Right? And there's, you can actually set up all kinds of complicated routing, but in general, that's just kind of the way we'll think about it. So there's, uh, and this is where routers come in. So a switch doesn't do anything, right? Only lets machines talk to each other on their local network, right, in their subnet. When you have a router, that's now when, if the machine's not on your local subnet, you can give the packet to the router, and the router will try to get it to where it's trying to go. Okay. So if we can't get the packet from, if it's not on our local network, we know we have to use indirect delivery. So the gate, so the idea is the host only needs to know the next hop, one hop, right? So you have a packet, it's not on the local network, send it to the gateway. So the gateway has its own routing table that says, hey, if it's going to these type of address, put it here. If it's going to these other type of address, put it here. So it has another hop. And then finally, and that hop will tell it where to go. And then finally it'll keep going until either the TTL is decreased to zero, in which case the packet is dropped, where it finally gets to its destination and uh, the destination machine receives it. So yeah, so it keeps going until finally somebody's on the same local network as that target machine that you're trying to send it to and they get the packet. And then we use direct de delivery. So this is the critical thing, right? So we talked about, this is why we focused on direct, de direct delivery first because every hop is using direct delivery, right? So when I want to send a packet to my gateway, the destination IP address will be the machine I'm trying to talk to. 
But the destination MAC address will be the gateway's MAC address because I need to send this packet to the gateway. And the gateway will see that and then figure out where it goes next and it will create its own Ethernet or link layer frame to pass the packet on and so on until it finally gets to its destination. Cool. So, we have two machines, completely different networks. So we have 111, 10, 20, 121, and 128, 111, 41, 10. Right? So a key thing is the IP, well, most of the IP headers stay the same for every hop. Right? What changes? The TTL, yeah, the main one that changes. And the checksum will change to update that, right? Um, so, but the source and destination IP remain the same at every step along the way. That's an important thing to remember. Um, the TTL field is decreased, and the link layer addresses actually change at every step, right? So the source, the, at the first hop from here to this gateway, the source MAC address will be this MAC address, and the destination MAC address will be this, the gateway's MAC address. And then from there, the source MAC address will be the next hops. Wait, the source MAC address will be the gateway's MAC address, the destination MAC address will be the next hops, and so on and so forth, right? So you can see that the, when you think about the layers of a packet, kind of like, um, if you've ever done this to somebody, and like wrapped a present multiple times, so they open up one layer, there's another layer below. Right? So you can think about a packet as kind of like a package that every time one layer is being taken off and then the next hop rearranges a new layer, puts it on, they take off one layer, rearrange it, and keep pushing it <coughs> off. And so, and the other core idea here is that, well, the process where we're trying to go to is based on the destination IP address. So each node only needs to know how to get traffic either to its local addresses or to somebody else to pass it along. Yes? Uh, how does the destination router know that to which local machine the data can should be passed? Ah, perfect. Okay. So <coughs> when the packet gets here, right, at this local router or this local gateway, it gets it, it looks at the IP address, and then what does it look at? Okay. A subnet. Because it has configuration that says this is your subnet. And it will say, oh, this is a, for a machine on my local subnet. I need to do direct delivery. So then it, if it doesn't know that person's MAC address, it does an ARP query to say who has this IP address, gets a reply with the MAC address, and then packages that packet in the MAC address and sends it on forward. So it's exactly the reverse. <laughs> That's a different issue. We'll talk about, well, I think we'll talk about matting at some point, but okay. we can assume that these are both public IDs. Okay. Right? We're trying to get from us to Google and we're both on public IP addresses. Cool. Okay. So we can see, now that we already kind of did it, but yeah, so we can see, we talked about it. So this packet goes across, and at each step, the yellow layer is being destroyed and recreated, depending on the link layer. So I guess for Q, so this is like my computer, and this is like my friend's computer. Yes. And like, if you're both on the public internet, let's say you so both yeah. have publicly accessible IP addresses. And um, okay. so it's gonna connect to like ISP, and it's gonna go through a bunch of servers. Yes. And how is it gonna, how do those servers know get the destination address? I don't, I'm not getting involved. Yes, so that's this big, I should replace this with just like a big like cloud, like amorphous blob. Uh, the basic idea is, at a high level, they've all decided where to route traffic. And each ISP, so each ISPs have agreements with other ISPs of how they want to route traffic and how much they want to charge. So some routing decisions are based on cost. Right? If I see you have a packet for Netflix and I have agreements with two different providers, they both can get to Netflix, but one is cheaper for me, I'm gonna send it that way even if I know it's gonna be slower for you. Because what do you care? You're still gonna get your video. Right? <laughs> So that's part of it. The other aspect is there's a protocol called BGP that each autonomous network is running so that they can announce to each other what IP addresses belong to them. So that allows them to say, hey, I'm in charge of this IP address right now. Um, and that can be changed. And uh, yeah, it's actually the 
source. There's been a lot of denial of service attacks from in allegedly incorrect BGP routes. So for instance, I um, can't remember which country it is, which is good, I shouldn't just guess, like maybe guess, but they want to take off Twitter, they want to censor Twitter from their network. So instead of basically sinkholing and capturing and saying like, oh, if you want to go to Twitter, you go to this non-existent page. What they did was they advertised the BGP route that said, hey, we're the uh, authority network for Twitter's IP address. And that meant everybody in the world, whenever they want to talk Twitter, and all IP, ISPs would send their traffic to that one person, which who was not Twitter. And so essentially they hijacked their IP address that way. Um, because yeah, that's the problem, is each network needs to know where to pass their traffic to. Um, so those are actually fairly rare, which is surprising. And uh, a person in my, when I was doing my PhD at Santa Barbara, trying to do a study to look at, can you, like get yourself into the BGP network and try to inject fake routes. Uh, it turns out, because there's actually not a ton of BGP peers, they're all uh, admins who kind of know who's who, uh, they were pretty secure and we couldn't get in and spoof things, so. Yeah. Yes? Um, as a no. Yes, so if you receive a packet, you have no idea how it got there. How do you? Reply. Yeah, you use a source IP address, and you just send that packet back, hope that it goes the right way and gets to that person, right? So that's you. Um, so that was part of those IP options we looked at. There were debugging options that each hop would put a stamp, so you could see what route it traveled through the network, but they've stopped. I don't think you can do that anymore. Do you have more questions? Beforehand, well, no, and kind of yes. Can you look at that counter? Yeah, we'll look at if if you could if you could know the source if this was like you somehow, right? You can send a packet and see what the TTS at the end, and then you know about how many hops it went through. That was my next question. If, if the source machine machine does not know how many hops the packet's going to take, how does it reset the TTS when it's Ah. How many bits was the TTL value? Eight. Eight. How many, what's the max value you put in there? 255. 255, so that's what people do. <laughs> Essentially this means you're not, you're more or less not more than 255 hops from, uh, from whoever sent it, yeah. And of course, you know, when you get into natting, things change, and a lot of weirdness happens in the network. So you gotta think like some of the big backbone things, they can take your packet and like wrap it in another protocol and then send it along their own proprietary protocol in their networks. And then when it gets to the end of somebody else, they pop it out and pop an IP packet towards you. So you would never know, maybe you went through five other non-IP hops. You won't know. That's fine. Cool, yeah. Uh, it's terrifying that it all works. <laughs> This is uh, one of the things, the more I learn about computers and especially security, the more shocked I am that everything still works. Like, think about how much money is pumping through the system and it's just all, this is how it all works. It's not magic, it's just packets going through and it's best effort. And, yeah. Is there any organization that sort of monitors what's happening in the net and looks for inefficient routing or efficient routing reports on it? I don't know, that's a good question. Um, anybody a networking person who knows that? Any networking PhD students? That I don't know. Um, I'm sure, well, no, the short answer is I don't know. I mean, some of the things that they're trying to do to relieve congestion, right, because there's so much, if you look at the data that's being pushed through the internet with the rise of streaming video, it just has really increased. So. Basically the way they get around that is Netflix goes and says, hey, you want to reduce the load you're paying in your network? Great, let us put a box in your ISP and we'll cache popular movies and serve them from our box. So it's great for your customers because they get videos quicker and it's better for you because 
that traffic doesn't have to go all the way to Netflix's <coughs> servers crossing multiple ISPs who all pay for that traffic to go back. Um, so that's kind of, but the downside of that is the big play, you have to pay a lot of money to play that, those kind of games. Um, so yeah, you know, we're, I guess, yeah, I don't know of any organization that does that. That would be interesting. Okay, yeah, so the key in this diagram basically is the from and to MAC addresses change, right, at every single hop. So, this brings up things like if you ever hear somebody saying, oh, you know, authentication is easy or whatever, you just check the MAC address of whoever sent you the packet, right? You can know that they don't actually understand how networking works because when you receive a packet, what MAC address do you see as the source? The gateway, the previous hop, exactly. You don't see, you never see the other machine's MAC address unless they tell you explicitly in some other protocol, right? Cool. Okay. So, ah, yeah, so there used to be multiple types of routing. I kind of alluded to this a little bit. Uh, the primary method now is hop by hop routing, where you just say, hey, go here, and you know, I want to talk to this node on the network, this IP address, and then your packet will hop through the network. Uh, it used to be that you could actually do source routing, so you could tell the network exactly how you want your packet routed, like we talked about that has problems with security. You could maybe overload certain nodes on the network. Um, and really, the ISP can care less what you think your package should be routed as. Right? They're going to do what's best for them and their customer. Um, another, it, oh, another interesting fact that I like about source routing. Uh, does anybody know how emails, what email addresses used to look like? So the host name of an email address. So you have the username, at, and then a host name. But your host name would be host1, exclamation point, host2, exclamation point, host3, exclamation point, host4. And that would actually specify how to get your email from your machine to their machine. So you would have to specify in the email address all the, in this case it would be IP hops, but uh, I believe it's SMTP hops that it would need to go to correctly get to their system. Um, they got rid of that pretty quick, well, I don't know how quickly, but yes, thankfully that's gone now. We don't have to think about that. I like the parallel there between source routing and email, essentially source routing. Yeah. Uh, in the previous slide, you mentioned uh, they won't know about the source MAC address. Yes. Then how do you trace somebody? How do you trace somebody? Yeah, if they get any fraudulent. Uh, so, how do you trace somebody? Uh, so who knows? So let's think about, in this case, this host on the left. Who knows their MAC address? <laughs> your gateway. So in the case of when you plug your machine directly into the public network, who's your gateway? Fox? Yes, your ISP, right, is your gateway. And so if they see you doing anything, and they also are the ones that give you an IP address, right? So they know your IP address, they know your MAC address, they also know what port you're connected on. I mean, they know physically where you are. They know your billing information, all your customer information. So that's why when they detect, when they, if they see this IP address causing trouble or doing something illegal, they can know who it is. Now, they can know, but this is a good uh, foreshadowing. So if we look here, if 128.111.4.1.10 gets, let's say, an attack traffic from 111, 10, 20, 121, does that mean that host sent it? Why not? It might be spoofed, right? We saw that nobody is checking the IP address, right? They just look and see, oh, this is trying to go to somewhere. Nobody's checking who it's coming from, right? So just because you receive, now it's important to think, remember, just because you receive an IP packet from a source machine doesn't necessarily mean that that person sent it. So that's an important thing to think about. Yes. Is there a reason like your ISP doesn't do this checking of 
Because they could do it on the gateway. Is it just too expensive or? Uh, too slow. Yeah, too slow. they tried to do the commons thing, unfortunately. So the, from my understanding, some ISPs do this. So it's called uh, egress filtering, where you filter out the traffic that's going out based on the IP addresses that are coming from inside your network. So one thing is it depends on how big your subnet is. If you had a large subnet, you could pretend to be somebody else's IP address on the subnet. Um, if you move somebody from a completely different network, then it's on the gateway or the ISP to filter that traffic out. And some networks do, and unfortunately, enough other networks don't that it's still a problem on the internet today. Yeah. Uh, if you run a TCP dump at the destination, then uh, how much information you can extract from there? Like uh, from where, uh, what was the fork or the last copy? <laughs> so yeah, you'll know, you get this packet right here. That one. Yeah. So you know, from at the link layer, you'll know <coughs> who sent you the packet, right? On your local network. You'll know that it was addressed to you. You'll know that the packet, the IP address was directed to you, right? So the two address is correct. <laughs> but everything else in that packet could have been changed and altered by an attacker, right? So you can't, you don't actually know that that other IP address sent you a packet, right? You know you got a packet and the packet says that it's from that person. And so we'll look at other ways that protocols deal with this uh, issue. But fundamentally, you know very little. You know that you got some information. And this is what makes Denial of service attacks so difficult to prevent because you're just getting a bunch of packets and they're probably not even from who they say they're from. And it's overloading your network, right? You're getting so much, you're getting overloaded. So, um, yeah. Cool. Okay. So, we talked about text and routing, hop, source. So, it used to be we talked about this. So, using source routing, routing um, you could maybe force people. You could maybe force sniffing through there. Um, so, yeah, so one thing, right, if I, if I can specify how to reply to me, right, like, oh, when you want to talk back to me, talk through these hosts, right, then I can maybe spoof other IP addresses because you'll reply directly to me, right? So this is other reasons about why this is completely gone away. Uh, it's not pretty much not used by any routers, although that would be interesting to investigate which ones do use that and why. Like, uh, that would be pretty cool. So, each hop in the network is maintaining this table. So, in, well, I think in new versions of the Linux kernel, the route command <coughs> is, I think, maybe still works, but is subsumed by the IP command. Anyways, you can look up, just Google how to look at routes on your operating system. Um, it'll show you its, its routing table, so it'll say the destination, the gateway, some mask flags, and what interface. So, in the simplified model we looked at, right, you just had one interface and you had one gateway, right? But you may actually have multiple interfaces. You may be connected to multiple different subnets. You may have different gateways that you want traffic to go out of. Um, and so this allows you complete flexibility in how you control your networking environment. So, for instance, this is specifying. So the um, this is specifying that 192.168.1.24. So this gen mask defines the gateway. So it's a bitwise AND. So you look at two by five. All two by fives is one. So you mean that's what you use as the gateway. So here, this is uh, a gate. Or sorry, not a gateway. A subnet. So you're, you're defining this is one host. So you're saying if you want to talk to this host, they're on Ethernet. Uh, Interface zero. So they're on your local network. Talk to them. So you can specify exactly. So you can make all kind of complicated routes. Like if you want to talk to this host, use this interface. If you want to talk to this other host, even though they could be on the same network, use this other interface. Then you can say if you want to talk to anybody in the 192.168.1.0, so here the <coughs> subnet would be the gen mask bitwise and with the destination IP here. So this is a subnet of 192.168.1. If you want to talk to anybody there, they're on interface zero. So this is a local network, right? 
If you want to talk to 12700 with a subnet mask of 255, so anything below 1.2.7, talk to the local interface. So what is this? Local host, the loopback interface. So this is actually something that a lot of people don't realize is we think of it as one uh, one two seven zero zero one is like the standard home network, but actually anything that's in the subnet of one two seven is also local host. So this is actually some way you can get around filters that filter out local host, like things that will make a URL request to and deny local host or one two seven zero zero one. Is it zero one one? Zero zero one, right? You can get around that by using different values for those, and it will still go to the local interface. And if you look up the spec for what local host is, it specifies exactly this. So this is by the RFC spec. Then finally, if it doesn't match any of these things, right, all zeros, zero gen mask, then this means our default gateway is sent it to 192.168.1.1 on interface zero. So the flags mean that it's up, it's a good route, G means that it's a gateway, H is a host, so this is how to talk to this specific host, uh, and then there's other messages in here. So it's always interesting, especially if you start playing with virtual machines, when you start installing virtual machines, which create virtual interfaces, your routing table gets a little wonky and weird, um, and you can look at it to kind of see how packets are actually moving through your network. And so the way this routing works is it goes from most specific to least specific, right? So what's the most specific thing I have on this table? The first one, the host, right? If you're trying to talk to, that is the most specific. If you're trying to talk to a specific host, use this rule, right? Then less than that is if you're trying to talk to a host on this network. And then if you're trying to talk to anybody who's not 127.001, then talk to 192.168.1.1, use this rule. So that's how the rules are processed, and that's how you should think about that as you look at these tables. So yeah, you see, do any hosts match? Do any network addresses match? Then you search for a default entry, and you do it just as we talked about. Uh, if you can't, if there's no route, has anybody ever seen this, and you're trying to access the internet, or you're trying to run a ping, and you get a host unreachable or network unreachable, um, this would be either two things. A, Either your kernel has no route to the host, maybe you have your DHCP, hasn't, you don't even have an IP address, it has no way to talk to the host, or maybe your gateway. So if you try to, if you um, do this at home, you can run ping, like pinggoogle.com, see that it's pinging correctly, and then on your router, unplug the WAN port, or just unplug your cable box, your cable modem. And you'll see that you'll start getting ICMP messages back that says, I think it's host unreachable, which would be from your gateway machine saying, sorry, I can't talk to anybody. Uh, I can't get this packet anywhere. Which is nice that you actually get a reply rather than just not knowing and hanging forever. Uh, so you can do routing tables. You can set routes statically if you need to configure stuff specially. Or use routing protocols like DHCP, which allows the gateway to dynamically tell you how to issue routes and what your route should be, what your gateway should be. Okay, so. The attack we wanna look at now is taking our IP spoofing attack and doing it on the network. So we want to spoof an IP packet from a machine that is not our own and send it to a destination machine, right? We just kinda talk about this at a high level. Um, and my animations are a little weird, sorry about that happen sometimes, there's a lot of things to click on. So, why is this called blind? Yes? You can't really see anything once you send a packet. Right, when we send our packet out, we spoof it from somebody else. When that machine gets the packet and they reply, what happens? It goes to that other machine, right? We never see the reply to our packet, and fundamentally we can't. And this is another important concept, and this is why I'm harping on it again, because this forms the basis of security of TCP handshakes, as we'll see. Um, 
So we want to send an IP diagram with another host. And the idea is it's really easy. We just change the source IP address to be from that target IP address, and we send out the packet. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that we do not get the reply. We will never see that reply. So there's a trust relationship here between 135 and .10, right? So there's a trust relationship here, and we want to spoof essentially a packet from 128.111.41.135. <coughs> So we send that out, it gets here, and now the important thing is, so now the packet gets there, right? Everything goes fine, but then when it replies, we never see the reply. Yes? Uh, the router check checks the source address, or is it just the destination? Just the destination, a lot of times. Um, it would be... Maybe you could test this, but you'd have to spoof an IP address that you control. You don't want to spoof somebody else's IP address. Um, that would be interesting to study. And actually, I've talked with some other professors about, because this is a problem, right? We could fix a lot of IP spoofing attacks if we stopped, if every network would not allow traffic outgoing that was not from its IP range. Um, and one of the ideas was name them and shame them. So it's measure them and make a list so that people could see which ISPs were the worst about not doing this. Um, and the reverse, which ones are good about doing this. Um, so yeah, it would be an interesting research project to do to try to understand and measure this. A lot of students do that. So, blind IP spoofing, we'll look at other kinds of spoofing. <coughs> One thing that we need to think about, right, is on this path, right, every hop in this network, this packet is essentially sent as is. So I won't say in the clear or not, but it is sent as is, right? So this yellow packet that we sent originally in the network, every gateway and router along the way sees that packet, right? So in this way, it's very similar to a postcard, right? <coughs> a mailman can read your postcard, just like every router along here can read your packet. This is why we need, and we add encryption on top of all these layers. But fundamentally, at the <coughs> IP layer, there's no security in here for any of these things. So any node can read your packets. Which then allows us to think, what happens if we take over one of these routers? Pretty cool, right? So this is kind of what forms the basis that we can think about as a man-in-the-middle attack. So the idea is host A and B are trying to talk, but actually all their packets are flowing through C. And they could be doing that because, like we saw, in a local network, we've done ARP poisoning, and we've convinced all the packets to go through us. Um, and so if we can control a gateway, we can sniff all the traffic, right, as we saw, which is awesome. We can intercept or block traffic that we don't like. If we're an authoritarian country that we want to enforce our policies, we can look at all the traffic coming in and out of our country and block those that we do not like, hypothetically. We can modify traffic, right, so we can change the contents of packets as they're going across. Uh, we can perform a full band in the middle attack, which is that we basically completely, uh, we just impersonate the other host, right? So we could not even send any traffic to that other host and just pretend to be, let's say, google.com or your bank. So this is fundamental to the architecture of the internet. So if you think about why we have such bad security problems, why we have to have HTTPS, why we have to have all these other protocols, it's because fundamentally at the network layer, we can't ensure anything. Okay, and the middle attacks. Now we're going to look at some really cool, we're going to circle back to a problem that we looked at. So, anyone remember what's the maximum size of an IP packet that we can send? Roughly. 
like 65,000 bytes rounded to the nearest power of two, right? So uh, that could be 65,000 bytes. What was the max limit on an Ethernet frame? 1,500, right? Is there anything about anything that we've talked about in this routing diagram that says that Ethernet has to be used at every one of these link layers? No. Right? They could be using something else that's smaller than Ethernet. Right? Or maybe we're on a network that allows larger than Ethernet frames. So what happens if we try to send a packet of size 65,000? <coughs> what would suck? If it just drops, right? That would suck. Because IP says we should be able to send packets of size 65,000. And now you're telling me it depends on the network? Or what if I send a packet of size 15,000 here and somebody else along the way just dropped it? Because they only support 900 bytes of link layer frame. Right? That would suck. So this is where we looked at very briefly these mechanisms and uh, uh, items in the header of IP packets for fragmentation. So the idea is IP actually has a way to if uh, the packet can't be sent because of a link layer, a message goes back and it tries to get our, no, does it go back? Oh, interesting, I'll think about that in a second. Um, essentially what it'll do, it will fragment and break up that packet into sizes that can fit across that network. But now we need to know, well, what do you do when you receive all these little fragments of packets, right? You have to reassemble them back into the original 65,000 bytes. And so this is where fragmentation comes in. It's important to study because it's one of those things that uh, your packets don't, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm fairly certain your packets don't get fragmented anymore. Um, they've done a lot of network studies to look at the network and they, you know, the operating systems have kind of put very solid IP frames in there for sizes. So your packets very rarely now get uh, fragmented. But the important thing that happens is this is where security vulnerabilities lie. So in complicated, rarely used corners cases of specs, this is where security vulnerabilities occur, and this happens again and again. So IP fragmentation is a prime candidate and has caused several pro high profile security vulnerabilities. Uh, so we will look at this on Monday. Like.